everybody, welcome to Tio's Roadhouse in the house with Jay DeMarcus, formerly of Rascal Flats yeah. and now an entrepreneur and record label executive and all those good things. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you too, buddy. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. I've been looking forward to this. I know, uh, I'm go ahead and get this first part out of the way. Y'all were scheduled to do your farewell tour and then COVID kind of put the brakes on that whole thing. Any possibilities of, of the band getting back together to try to wrap that up in the in the future? You know, I hate to say never. Uh, I, I really believe that there's a chance for us somewhere down the road to yeah. kind of give it its proper goodbye. I feel robbed of that in so many ways. It's like you need closure for that. Yeah, I really know? do. And, not, so, and the fans, too, I think. I think they do, too, and I'd love to do it for them. It's just it's one of those things that you don't get to go out on your own terms, and I've always felt a little bitter about that. Yeah. And so I would love to stand on stage. You know, I always say this, too. The last time we were on stage was the second week of March in 2020. Which and was COVID when everything it, shut down. It was starting to get really bad. So all we cared about was getting back home. And all of a sudden, uh, I got back home and the world shut down. And I realized, man, I didn't get to realize that was my last time on stage with these guys. I kind of wanted that moment to look across the stage and at least savor it and take it all in for what it was and to, to, to live in the moment. I've never been able to do that, and it makes me really sad. We were talking just before we turned the cameras on uh, about uh, Guns N' Roses being back together and, and uh, how well they were doing, so I, I don't think you can never say never. The Eagles got back together, too. <laughs> I know. I know they did, and, and I, you know, I love to think about the possibilities of doing something. And Gary and I are cousins, so... I would think that if we don't do it, eventually our moms are going to whip our asses. <laughs> y'all had such a great run, too. What what label? Y'all, were y'all on Universal? We started out on Lyric Street, and then we went to Big Machine. Gotcha. And y'all had a, a deal for several years, man. You had some massive, massive records. I remember doing shows with you guys, man, at the heyday. Y'all had 11, 12 buses or semis on the road. Y'all had massive production, too. I'd like That's to have big... some of that money back we spent on all those buses and trucks. <laughs> Do you, th do you think it makes a difference when you're at that level? Everybody wants to push it as hard as they can and have that lasting memory in people's minds. You know, Tracy, I'll tell you something. I don't. I think I was so naive, and I just went along with whatever our manager said. But knowing now what I know, I think I would have questioned things a little bit more and just made sure we were being smart about where we were spending our money. But thankfully, we were in such a place to where Live Nation was willing to kind of give us whatever we wanted, needed, and production money. So it seemed to make sense at the time, but... Now looking back, I, I wonder. You so know, what would that advice be to a young artist that's having that surge? And, and uh, is there some advice you could give them that would actually sink in? I hope so. That's what I hope to do at Red Street when we, whenever we sign new acts is just to really tell them to t pay attention to the business. I think the biggest mistake young artists make is not paying enough attention to the business. Ask questions of your business manager and your manager. Make sure you know why they're doing what they're doing for you because it's easy easy to keep your head down, keep your head in the sand, and keep trucking along without asking questions. And I always tried to do that. I think I drove my manager, Clarence Spalding, nuts because I'd call him every day. I think when you're young, though, I mean, I see so many just like we were, man, you dream of doing this your whole life. And then when you get your shot and things start rolling, it's like, just put your head down, keep working, man. Hopefully everything will be there at the end of it all. But it, it, it gets a little bit overwhelming. I mean, things can take off so fast. I've been watching... Uh, Blaney Wilson and how proud I am for her. You know, just a couple oh, yeah. of years ago, she's riding around on one bus and, and opening up for me, and all of a sudden, boom, she's got nine CMA nominations. Every time you turn the TV on, she's everywhere. And there, I know that they're running her absolutely to death. We remember those days when you're hot and everybody wants a piece of you. Yeah. It's so hard to manage all that stuff. It's hard to hang on, and it's also hard to develop the courage to say no when you need to so you can take care of yourself. I think so many times I've seen so many artists burn out because of that endless rabbit wheel that they're on. You know, that what do you call that thing where the rabbit gets on the wheel? Is that a rabbit wheel? Hamster Is that what it's called? Wheel. Hamster wheel. Yeah. Ha hamster, that alligator, rabbit. rabbit. Do something else. One of them mammoth animals. <laughs> Rabbits are known for something else. <laughs> Rabbits are made to make stew with. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, but it's hard to get off the hamster wheel when you're on it and take care of yourself. And I think mentally and physically sometimes people get caught up on it. 
and they don't really check themselves and go, I need to take a minute here. I need to learn how to say no because this isn't the best thing for me mentally or physically. Yeah, and it's a lot easier looking back after you've had, you know, 20, 30 years on the road and, and put all that stuff into perspective. What and, and really try to be somebody that you can give good advice to your younger peers and stuff. What is what? How do you define your role at Red Street? What are you, what are you doing? You're producing records. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what's really your, your designated role? There. I produce a little bit, but one of the things that's rewarding for me right now is being able to pass on whatever knowledge I've learned in almost 30 years of being in the music business. I started out in Christian music, so this is actually my second record deal, yeah. my sec second different act. So I've learned a lot over the years, and what I hope to provide for our artists is um, an open forum for them to come into my office and ask me questions about anything they may wonder about. I hope that they see in me somebody that has been where they're trying to get to. I've been very, very blessed, as you have, to be at the top of what our industry has to offer. And I hope that they're smart enough to take advantage of any of the knowledge that I might have to help them avoid maybe some of the pitfalls that I personally had to learn yeah. the hard way, you know? And that, that's the question that I was asking, just how you take all that knowledge and translate it into good advice for these young artists. And it's, you know, I look back and, and you're so naive and, and you know, you're all you really want to do is focus on playing music and... You know, you think about a, a record label that's got, you know, all these regional promotion people and they're out all the time. A label's got five or six acts or how many that they're working currently mm -hmm. with a record on the radio. And they got these expense accounts and they're all spending that expense account. And you're getting billed back for every freaking thing. Yeah. And they're going out and buying $500 of wine and they're doing all this stuff. When you're young, you don't think about that. And it's almost to the point that you feel like you're not even allowed to ask the questions, too. I know. You know, that's a difficult situation. Uh, and it is, and I feel like we have a different environment at Red Street for that reason because I am very upfront and honest uh, about every dime that we spend on each artist. And I think you got to be more frugal now than you used to. You really, really do because it's harder to make money for all of us, so you've got to really pay attention to what's going out. And and I, sometimes there are times you step in and you save the artists from themselves, and you say, I'm not going to let you spend any more money because you're getting yeah. in too big of a hole that you're never going to claw your way out of. And what's weird today about not everybody but most of the newer artists coming up you can look in their eyes and see that they have this look even though you're telling them everything that you've learned and trying to pass on whatever you have a lot of them sit there and look at you like you don't know what you're talking about i've got it figured out oh yeah and boy, they find out the hard way that they don't. Yeah, boy. And it can happen so quick, and you'll realize that the people that you trusted most, and sometimes family members, will uh, take advantage of you in some very painful ways. Yeah, It's a, it's a sad yeah. lesson to learn in life, but the music business is, uh, it, it, it's, you know, I used to think that, you know, you look at a career like George Strait, somebody that's been on a record label for all these decades and stuff, those things are rare nowadays, man. If you get a 10-year career, labels are moving on to somebody else because they really don't want smart artists. They want, they want to move on to the next one. They, they really don't. And they get too smart. They want to be finished with them real quick. Absolutely, because yeah. you ask too many questions. That's right. Yeah, that's that's a that's a tough transition. I, I respect you a lot because I, I know that you've always been more hands on on the business side, and I've always tried to be that way too. A lot of it from hard lessons learned. Uh, yeah, I mean, it'll make you study really quick when you learn something the hard way, won't it? So it, yeah. you make sure it doesn't happen again, and that's. That's kind of where I was. You know, we went through a management transition. We went through a record label transition. And they were both really tough seasons in our career. And I wanted to I wanted to make sure that I avoided similar situations if they were ever to come up again. I wanted to be well educated so that I knew I knew how to better navigate those waters when they came. What are the differences now? Uh, say the first five years of Rascal Flats as a commercially viable hot artist out there compared to a young act right now. What are the differences in the industry comparatively speaking? I think we got in, I like to say, at the end of the golden age of record making when you could really still sell a lot of records. Record labels were more patient. They would give you time to grow a career and not just expect you to have a hit and move on to the next. We live in such a cookie-cutter environment right now that if you don't have success out of the gate, you're more than likely going to be dropped. Yeah. But record labels back then would spend the money, spend the time to try and build a, an actual career for you so that you could have longevity and not just take a chance on one single and it didn't work, so we're going to throw the next thing against the wall to see if it sticks. you think that's gone out the window now? I mean, being able to try to... I, I hope it... 
hope against hope that at some point that will come back and artists will be allowed to be the creative force that makes them identifiable and unique in the market space. I'd like to see that come back. There's a little place down on Music Row called Red Street Records. It's <laughs> trying to change that environment. And so I feel like we are artist-friendly and artist-driven, and we take the time and spend the right money to try to develop acts and not just throw them away if the first or second single doesn't work. How, uh, how big's the staff? We've got uh, 478 people right now. I'm kidding. Uh, it feels like I'm paying that many people. Uh, we've got 22 on staff, and we also have some uh, consultants that work for us. But we've got the entire second floor of the Starstruck building there and part of the half of the first floor. So it's we've grown really, really fast. But my philosophy was if we didn't have the right team in place, who would want to sign with us? If we didn't have competent people, I could go to artists all day long and say come over here to my record label I ain't got nobody that knows what they're doing but oh, so yeah. I wanted to put the team in place so that we'd be attractive how how difficult is it to work radio right now what what are there 18 currents on the charts right now something like that 17, 18. it may be small it's really really tough especially when they play three Morgan Wallen songs back to back to back I mean how do, you, all time. how do you I mean <laughs> <laughs> nothing say. against Morgan Wallen but how do you combat that you can't it's very little you can do about that but it's really competitive and we're in the trenches every day swinging and it's a dog fight but thank god there are still some radio folks out there that take a chance on things that they love and they believe in if we didn't if we didn't have those we'd be dead in the water you know you know i uh I was blessed to have a lot of great relationships with radio. And I, I think one of the most difficult things after your radio career is done, when you're making that transition to the next stage of your career, is wondering what kind of career you're going to have. That was kind of overwhelming to me. But if you've got a body of work, there's so much stuff that you can do on the backside of radio. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's so many tools available for us out there that we didn't have before. I do too. How are you utilizing all those tools with your new artists? Well, we're just trying to get our people out in front of as many people as they can be in front of, and we're doing all the normal things you would do with, you know, doing radio shows, doing as many things as will give exposure to our artists as possible. And it's it's challenging now because you have this clogged up uh, intersection of all these new artists trying to scramble for the same things. Yeah. But I also feel like we've got more tools now than we ever had before. So there, it's a blessing and a curse because with social media and with being able to break artists different ways through streaming or TikTok or whatever it may be, we've got more tools at our disposal, disposal to break an artist. So that also help us, helps us a little bit too. That So we're not so reliant on radio or touring to try to get us exposure you know one of the things that i have trouble gauging on uh when you you know from our era when you release a single and you you feel it start to get traction and you know you know you can feel you can feel the intensity building up with the fan base as it goes top 40 and then top 30 and then as you hit top 10 you can really start to feel it if it's reacting and it's having an impact yeah one of the things I miss about having hits on social media, whether you got a number one on iTunes or, you know, you're having a, a, just a huge impact on some lyric video you're doing, you feel a little bit, but you don't get to feel that giant wave. How do you, can, are you able to no. gauge that with the analytics that you're looking at? I, I, it's tougher to gauge it that way, but you can certainly see whether or not the active listeners are going and seeking out the song and streaming it, not because it's on a playlist, but because they've gone through the motions to download it and add it to their own playlist. So you feel the impact that way. But the problem I have with people that break a song on social media or have a moment on TikTok or have a moment on Instagram or YouTube is that we're not creating entertainers it doesn't mean that they're stars because they have a moment on social media that is the problem how do you back it up yeah because you don't really know what happened the first time throw them in front of a crowd and see if they can hold a crowd yeah. and they know how to entertain folks that is the art of what you and i grew up doing and cutting our teeth in the honky tonks and playing in bars i learned how to be an entertainer absolutely and learn how to put a four-hour set together and learn right. to save your big stuff to keep people on the dance floor as the room filled up all of you don't learn that by doing karaoke or, or singing into a tiktok you don't i mean and I, it, but but there's still a lot of positive aspects of that and i've I had a chance to sit down and, and visit with the, a few kids that have been making the transition from tiktok stars that have millions of followers but how do you translate that over into a commercial format that's a difficult transition to make it is i think you have to surround yourself with really really good people that give you great advice and help you build a show and help you build the kind of um 
set list that keeps people interested because one again one song isn't going to hold a crowd's attention once you throw them out there in the middle of the water to see if they can swim as y'all are putting your roster together for your label uh are you are you considering the award slots duos trios groups male singles solos do you look look at that as you're as you're trying to build a stable of artists i never really have i i want to sign things that are compelling to me things that don't sound like everything else that i want to hear again so I, I look at the music first because I believe and I've always believed that hit songs will rise to the top no matter if they're a duo or a female or a male. I just want to find great artists that cut great freaking songs. That's all I care about. Uh, songs, we went through a, a bro phase. How do you feel about the songs that you're getting your hands on right now? Where, are we swinging back to more traditional? I think the pendulum's... A lot, a lot of pop stuff. I mean, what are you seeing? I think it's harder to get the pop stuff through now. And and quite honestly, I feel like it's swinging back to where the songwriting is deeper and meaningful again now. You know, there was a moment we had there where it seemed to be less of a focus for the lyrics to be really deep but i think we've got a lot of wonderful songwriters on the scene right now that are really writing some amazing stuff yeah i agree and i think there's a lot of really young artists and young songwriters that are coming in with just amazing perspectives uh and you know i I'm, i don't i can't say that the stuff that i'm hearing I'm not, I'm not a guy that's going to go out and cut songs about uh, saying things about social media and the lyric or yeah. dealing with social uh, uh, cultural things that are going on with the younger generation. But that does fit this young generation that's coming up because they're growing up in it. It's, it's just as natural as, as, as albums were to so us. So funny you that. say that. I was, cutting a, I was cutting a vocal last week on Chris Lane, and he was singing about texting somebody. And I sang that line in my head, and I was like, I don't think I could get away with singing that right now. That feels foreign to me, like singing about texting or checking out your Instagram. Like That's weird, but it fits for those artists that are living in that, that space right now. It does. Sonically, uh, uh, I think you think production's coming back to some of the places that it was. I think we got a little it it it, it got a little digital there. It got me. a little programming, and I love hearing live players on records, man. Yep. Nothing beats putting the best guys on the floor in a room and getting the best that they have to offer. I don't care. You can have the best. I program myself too, and I love the the whole exercise of that. But there's a human element that is missing sometimes when you don't have those guys on the floor bringing the best of what they have to offer. Absolutely. And there's so many great players out there these days, not just session players, but great road players too. Well, I appreciate that, buddy. They really are. <laughs> they really are, man. So let's go back to some of the Rascal Flat days, man. What's, oh, man. Uh, give, me, give me a couple of the big highlights that you had as some of the heyday out on the road. Man, I have so many wonderful memories with those guys. I, I think that my some of my favorite memories are of us on one bus. We went to three buses eventually in about 2010, I think, after Jodon started having babies. And uh, we, we lost some of that hang time together after the shows where we would sit around and just soak up of the joy of what we were able to do together and that's when we wrote songs and we'd sit around and have a few beers after the show and yeah. enjoy i'm sorry somebody's being noisy on the set <laughs> just, kidding. just had a, a serious moment too junior what'd you tear up that was Lindsay blowing something out of one of her holes <laughs> i gotta tie my shoe sorry about that that's okay <laughs> Trying to do an interview here, damn it. We're getting into some deep shit here. God. I don't think I can get that emotion back. <laughs> Wait a sec. Oh, I'd say some of the time sitting around. No, I, I really do miss the closeness of being on one bus. And I think we lost a little bit of that connection when we went to three buses. That Those were really great times for me. And, of course, the milestones of winning our first award together. I never will forget huddling backstage with just the three of us with our arms around each other. Um, savoring that moment and looking at each other in the eye and going, would you have ever thought this was possible for us? Those moments that we shared that no one will ever know about are the most special to me. I love being a Grand Ole Opry member. That was huge for me because I, I went there all the time as a kid. We would take our summer vacations to Nashville. I grew up in Ohio, but we'd always come down to Nashville for summer vacations. And I would sit in the nosebleed with my mom, and that's all we could afford back then, and look down at that stage and that circle. And 
never dreamed it possible for me to be on that stage someday, let alone be a member. So that's one of the biggest things for me. And of course, when they rechristened the uh, surgery center at Vanderbilt, the Rascal Flat Surgery Center, that is part of our legacy that we'll leave behind that I'm probably most proud of because it'll be here long after I'm gone. And that's just one of the many charity things that you're involved in. I, I did a golf tournament with, with y'all a few years ago uh, for, yeah. for children's cancer research and stuff, too. Uh, do you still do the, those things? I do, yeah. I'm, I'm actually uh, – the Delta Dental um, St. Jude's tournament I'm actually hosting this year, October 16th, out at the Golf Club of Tennessee. So I still stay connected there and do a lot of that. And Kevin Carter and I had a 20-year event for the Make-A-Wish Foundation that we ran – uh, it happened at the Palm every April. We The Palm would give us the restaurant, and all of the athletes and entertainers would go around to the tables and wait on the patrons that were there, and we had tip jars in the middle, and you'd sing to them, or you'd sign an autograph or a football. It was yeah. it was great, and so I, I love doing things like that because I, I feel like, first of all, I feel like you should give back if you're blessed, and and it's been a wonderful thing to be able to be a part of so many wonderful organizations. I think it's a big part of what we're supposed to do as human beings, especially when we've been blessed with so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, because that's, uh, did you ever experience any guilt with success? I mean, did, did Only when on? my family would get on to me that I wasn't doing <laughs> enough for them. I think your family can be the worst sometimes, you know. It's my, my daddy, he's gone now. He passed in October of 2020. I, we were very, very close, but my, my dad was... You know, he was the one of those that would sit around and go, when are you going to buy me that Cadillac, buddy? You know, ship it up here to me. And I'd be like, well, I bought your house. Is that a good start? Or do you want the Cadillac, too? <laughs> What's the Cadillac, too? <laughs> yeah. And a summer vacation home. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's exactly right. So I, I did, I felt guilty early on when we were touring and doing really, really great. I never, I grew up really poor, so I never dreamed in a million years that I would see the kind of financial blessing I did when Rascal Flats was firing on all cylinders. And there were moments that I would sit there and go, gosh, is this right? Like, I feel like I need to be doing more. Like, I'm not giving enough away. And my wife would be like, you're giving plenty away. Stop it, you idiot. Yeah, and it's a real hard. That's one of those other things of, of of wanting to be good counsel for young people. Secure your stuff, put it away because you don't know how long this ride's going to last. There are a lot of things that can mess this journey up, and and the hardest thing that I've learned is when you get momentum, whew, you better try to keep it going because when it stops, it's almost impossible to get back. Boy, that is the best best thing you could have ever said because there's so many people that live that, and you wish you could go back in time and go, we, you know you should have learned this lesson a long time ago because it is so hard to make it. It's so hard to make money, and it's even harder to keep it. Absolutely. And, and, and you see it happening with these young football players. They come in yeah. the NFL or whatever sports league, and they make millions of dollars, and then they retire with nothing. You know, I, I've always thought that it would be great if, if a group of artists would get together and put some kind of counseling situation together for young acts. Uh, they, they, need, they need guidance around them to help secure their money and put things away for a range any day and, and not going out and buying Lamborghinis. Yeah, they, they really do. I'm grateful that I had Marianne McCready early on in my career to give me a phone call and go, hey, I know you've never made money before, but let's, let's, let me do this for you and let's keep on, keep a hold of some of this and stock it, sock it away. Because if you never had it, it's easy to go, I want to do all this and get it out of my system. And so I thank God that I had some wise counsel early on to help me save some of what we made, or I might be one of those people sitting around with going, what happened to all of it? It can happen real quick. Really what can. was the first thing you indulged yourself with? I bought a Porsche. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I, that's the first thing that I bought that it was really like a splurge. I, of course, bought my house when my wife and I first got married, but the one thing that I kind of like, this is a little overboard. Maybe I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> and I never it's was around to drive it because we were on the road all the time. <laughs> do you still have it? No, yeah. I, I traded it in years ago. But that was the that was the first thing I splurged on. And then I I love guns, so I started buying up all kinds of antique guns. And I'm I'm a huge history buff, so I started buying like World War II weapons and trying to get a hold of a BAR and. Just silly stuff. Really? So history stuff, uh, Civil War stuff, United States love history, or just yes. all, all over the place? Uh, love U.S. history. Yeah. Uh, and I lived on the encampment of the Northern Army for the Battle of Nashville 
Uh, I lived on six acres on Hillsborough Road, and I metal detected all over there. Really? I found horseshoes and buckles and buttons, and yeah, it's, it's fun. So uh, just Civil War stuff, what other stuff? Uh, it, walk me through kind of the stuff that you read, what you watch on TV. I, well, I'm a huge World War II buff. I, I had uh, great uncles that, were, that served in World War II, lost a couple of them over there, and one in Japan and one in Germany. And I just, um, I've been so fascinated by that group of men and uh, you know tom brokaw called them the greatest generation and i really believe they were they don't make men like that a lot anymore. of pride man and my grandpa i grew up around him and he he's he blew his knee out so he couldn't serve but his brothers of course were were over there and they it's just a different breed of man they they went through things that are unimaginable they're depression kids that grew up and then went on to fight for their country and um the things that they faced in europe and in Asia are unimaginable. I don't think that we have the kind of people nowadays that could live through what they did and fight that kind of a war. I don't think so either. I, and I, I don't, I don't know what it would take to get our our this next generation back to a place that they view our country the way that those men viewed our country. They had yeah. a lot of pride. They were willing to give their lives for what they believed in in this country. And I think we've lost a lot of that. It makes me very sad. It makes me sad, too. I think about it all the time. I fear for our future. I feel fear for our kids that are yeah. coming up because I, I, I know firsthand accounts of men that would take their own lives because they couldn't serve when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. They would go to try to serve, and for whatever reason, they'd have a medical issue and couldn't serve, and they would commit suicide because they couldn't really? fight for their country. Yeah. Wow. I, I never heard about those things, but I'm sure that happened a lot. I mean, because people desperately want to go be a part of it. Yeah. Wanted to do their part. What's the oldest artifact that you found as you've metal detected? I found a button that was off of a uh, Union soldier's coat. So that's probably the oldest. I, that It is the oldest thing that I've been able to find. I, I found some horseshoes and some straps from like, um, you know, slings, but the button is probably the, the best. You collect thing. anything outside of uh, firearms and stuff? Um, Not really. I'm not a huge collector. My son is. My son collects football helmets. He's got a whole wall full of, like, all his favorite players. Yeah. It's pretty fun. Other than history, what do you do outside of the music business that gives you peace? <sighs> Go to church. That gives me the greatest peace. I think um, trying to stay grounded and keep my faith the center of what I do is probably the biggest part of me other than music. I'm consumed with music. I grew up around it. I played it my entire life from my earliest memories. My family sitting around playing together. So music is really all I've ever known. When other kids were out playing in the summertime, I was in trying to learn all my favorite records and learn how to play them. And I, I just, I've been obsessed with it. So the only other thing that gives me peace and gives me an outlet is being in church and the golf course is a great place to go to, to clear your head and sort of get recentered. Very therapeutic. Yes, it is. So Unless no, you're playing bad, and then you can get pissed <laughs> off all over. Yeah, that has a lot to do with it. No fishing, no hunting, that kind of stuff. Kind of. I used to when I was a kid with my dad, and when I went to college, I got away from it and just never, never went back to it. Now Gary was always a big fisherman and a big hunter, and owns a bunch of land here in Tennessee, and he loves it, and I have an appreciation for it. I just never went back to it after I went off to college. Yep. So uh, Scott plays piano in the band. Y'all met when we first came in. And uh, Derek Jr. Uh, is the second guitar player in the band. I always let them ask some questions. So let's see what they got worked up for oh, you today. Oh, I put them on the spot again. Oh, man. Uh, we may have to delete this if I'm wrong. But did, Don't did, say did, another cuss word, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to cuss. Uh, did, you, did you produce a Chicago record? Is Chicago that, 30. Yeah, I was, I was wondering about how that was compared to a new artist and how did you walk that tightrope i mean having respect for what they've already done and then you come in how do you make how do you get that together that was probably the toughest record that i ever produced um because i felt such a first of all they were one of my favorite bands growing up i mean i idolized them my dad turned me on to the old uh chicago stuff in the late 60s and 70s and then i grew up in the 80s in the david foster era and David was one of my favorite producers growing up. I loved all the 80s stuff that he did. So I was already a fan of the band, and I felt this responsibility to keep its integrity and to really pay homage to the early Chicago and the 80s that made them so popular. 
And so when I got the call, I was, uh, it was Thanksgiving of 2005. I'll never will forget it. Robert Lamb called me and asked me if I'd like to produce the next Chicago record. Awesome. It was the greatest phone call I've ever gotten in my life. And I immediately went into panic mode, like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? How am I going to tell the guys that I've loved my entire life they're not playing something right or they're not executing well enough? And it was funny going through that process because there were definitely times they hadn't been in the studio for a while where I had to really go, hey, guys, this needs to be better. This needs to be tighter. The horn guys hadn't been in the studio for a minute, so they started playing out of tune, and I was like, We've got to tighten this up. And so there were some tense moments, but it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. A, because I got a lifelong friendship out of it with Jason Chef. He then went on to be one of my dearest friends and sang in my wedding. And we're in a band now together called Generation Radio. So that musical experience was so wonderful for me. But with a new artist, you kind of don't know what you're getting into, you know? Yeah. You're, you're starting with a blank canvas. With Chicago, I had all of this history to live up to. So it was very, very daunting to go in the studio with those guys. That's pretty interesting. I didn't realize that. Uh, production philosophy, when you go in there and do that, I mean, uh, producers all have a different way to approach things, and I haven't worked with a lot of them, but it seems like one of the most, one of the biggest qualities for a producer is keeping the energy level up and being able to motivate people and get the most out of them at that particular moment. It's got to be really difficult doing that with a seasoned band that's had tons and tons of hits. Yeah, they've seen it all. I mean, yeah. what kind of tricks are you going to pull that they haven't seen before? So I just tried to be the best coach I could, and I tried to be the best song guy that I could. And I had they gave me all, total autonomy on picking the music. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. So they would all turn songs in, and then I would go to publishers and get songs, and I would send the list of what I thought were. And quite honestly, sometimes they were – pissed at me because I didn't like a song that they had written or they felt like it was worthy of being included and so I had to dance that delicate dance too but I think at the end of the day they all appreciated the fact that I was trying to make the best record possible for them at that moment in time and it was really really fun because I think they saw in me not only somebody that respected the lineage and the history of the music that they had made but they knew that I knew what I was talking about when yeah. it came to production and what I thought we needed to do and the direction I thought we needed to go in. And so I'm, I i do not want to sound self-serving, but I think at a certain point they trusted me that I knew what I was doing. And I'm grateful for that. Do those guys come in knowing the number system and stuff or are they score readers? They're score readers and they would, you know, Jimmy Panko would write out a, he'd stand at the music stand and write out a horn part for all three horns and scratch it out and go, let's play this part right here. Or I would sing something to him, and I'd go, hey, Jimmy, how about the horns do a counter melody right here? And he'd go, I like that better. And he'd erase it, and he'd scratch it out and record it right on the spot. Wow, that's awesome. Wonderfully gifted musicians, no doubt about it. Wow. Were, all of them were. Come on, Junior. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so either from a band perspective or personally, what's an insult that you've received that you're the most proud of? An insult that I – oh, wow. I want to tell you um, – Gosh, I hate to call him out, but our first record came out, and Brian Mansfield wrote a uh, – He, I've joked with him about this before, so he's going to be fine. But he wrote our first review, and it said, Bouncy, Bouncy, Flop. <laughs> that was our very first review. <laughs> okay. We had four hits off that record and sold a million and a half records. <laughs> so I, I saw him at the Ryman one time several years later, and I was like – Please write another bad review for our next record. <laughs> I'm begging you, please. I'm always curious. Uh, I, I know what my song process was going through, and, and I was always very hands on with my NR department and stuff, and I had my own system. How do you? How do you go? Th how did you go through the song process with three guys that were equal partners in a in a trio like Rascal Flats as you were preparing for a record? We just beat Joe Don up and told him what we were going to cut. Okay. That <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, it was, it was the weird thing about Rascal Flats was we were so in lockstep when it came to the music that we loved. And we rec there were very few times we argued over songs. There were a couple of times I remember going, I don't know that I believe that song that much, but if you guys love it, let's cut it. And I think we all made those concessions every once in a while. But on the big ones, on the ones that were like our hits... We had unanimous agreement. You on, just knew. We did. We would hear it. We'd look at each other and go, holy crap, that's a rap. Whose idea was it to do Life as a Highway? 
Uh, that was John Lasseter's idea from Pixar. Wow. He flew to Nashville and pitched us the storyboards for, and and I remember sitting at that dinner going, talking cars like yeah. this is never this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. And he goes, and I want you guys to do Life as a Highway for this road trip segment right here. And he's showing us the whole story on storyboards at the dinner. And I'm like, oh my god, he wants us to do a Tom Cochran song. It's already been released three times. And I was really, really skeptical about it. And we went in and Dan Huff produced it. And the track that we did, I was like, all right, I'm wrong. I'm and, wrong about it. And this it was it was much better than the original. I thought that was a Thank massive, you. massive record. Yeah. I'm, Thanks. I appreciate it. It was fun. And I'm and I'm looking back now, obviously I'm thrilled that we were a part of that and it was huge for us. But we we had a really great process of picking songs. And the one thing I will say that I'm proud of is we were all three songwriters. But none of us were so uh, ego-driven that we couldn't say at the end of the day, that song beats mine out. We need to cut that one. I think that's always healthy, too. But that's yeah. a really hard thing to get your ego out of the way, especially when you start having success. But, man, it's really hard. But guys that go in and, and, and write songs like punching a clock that are going in every day and cranking them out, man. It's hard to compete with that sometimes. I don't care. I don't care how much you ride on the road. I couldn't agree more. And I, I've said the same thing so many times. It's like, how arrogant do you have to be to think that you can consistently beat someone that goes in every day and writes hits? Yeah, because there's something about getting into the rhythm of doing it all the time. And yeah. I mean, those guys just crank out. But the, but the imagery, I, I say this all the time. I think country songwriters the guys that do it for a living are the last true american poets man no they're the stuff that. there's nothing that beats them they're the best out there I, I i think they can compete with anybody in the entire world me too nashville's got the whole recording thing hey, down to birmingham is one of the most beautiful lyrics i've ever heard in my life it was a big record i know you know and i thought it was too pop when i heard when they really? played the demo for me yeah i thought it was man too i first me. heard that song as the demo yeah. and when you cut it i was like i knew that was going to be a hit uh, that's one of the. It's one of those things you just know. Oh my goodness, uh, you just know when you hear. It. Isn't that great when you're in the studio? It's the goosebump factor. And too. and you cut something and 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 you're listening to playback at the end of the day and it's like that's a freaking smash. Yeah. You know when you know. And it's funny. It's not. It's not arrogance either. No. You There's just, just something about it. You hear it playing back and you go, that's undeniable. Whether it was you singing it or not, that's a smash. Sometimes it's just undeniable. Yeah. And you wonder, you know, with the cancel culture and all the stuff going on in this day and age, some of the stuff that we cut, could you get it played on radio nowadays? How much has the no. format changed? No, you couldn't. As a matter of fact, I was joking with somebody a couple of weeks ago. They were talking about our first video, Praying for Daylight, and I'm like, I don't think they'd play that these days because... We're driving around in a car giving kids televisions. Well, it's like That's Bubba creepy. Shot the Jukebox. I mean, who's going to play Bubba Shot the Jukebox on radio yeah. these days? That's right. It's just a different day and age. I mean, what what good, I mean, as, as you look at the landscape, there's a, obviously we all have positive and negative things of the way that we, we see the music business and things that we wish were different or nostalgia about the old days. What's the positive stuff that you see going on in the record industry nowadays that you can capitalize on, that, that you really like where the music industry has landed. I really love the fact that we have this space we have now where there's room for so many more artists to be out there and to get their music heard to the world. I think that that's one of the positives of the age that we live in that's so digital now and uploading your music to the DSPs. And you don't, you don't even need a record label anymore to get your music out to the masses. That is really exciting because I believe we're discovering people we probably or maybe would not have otherwise discovered. Uh, the only thing about that, I, I wish that radio would open the uh, chart space up a little bit and play more current stuff. I'd like, I'd like, and I'd like to see them uh, speed the the process up a little bit back to twelve and fourteen week number ones like we used to have, so you can get more content. And it's got to be difficult as a record label person sitting on the other side. You know, knowing that you might be on the charts for 40 or 50 weeks. Back in the day, man, we were getting four singles a year. We were yeah. cranking them out every 12 to 14 weeks. You're picking out, you're coming off, you're letting it burn off, you're bringing another one. You're going in and you're dropping an album every year and a half, two years tops. And you're cranking them out so in 10 years you can build up a body of work. I know. Nowadays, you put an album out there, 
you might get four singles in two years, maybe. Tracy, I think you and I could fix this town. I buddy. think we could, but, <laughs> but I mean, it's. It, I'm really. I mean, how do you? How does an artist build a catalog and a body of work to work off of, if you if everything just takes so long to get up to the top of the it's, chart? I mean, it's the answer is, is it's tough. It's tough when you're working off of one single for nearly two years, and you you get it takes you fifty two weeks to get there. You got to hope and pray you can keep landing better tours with each passing year. Because season. you don't have the revenue from no. the album sales that we used to have, and streaming does not pay the same as a songwriter back in the day. And we're gonna get nostalgic. If you got four album cuts as a as a as a regular Nashville songwriter, you were making a quarter of a million dollars a year if you were on platinum. Even if you didn't get a single. That's right. Now, if you don't get a single, you're starving to death. Yeah. And you might you not even keep your publishing deal. I know. I know it's a travesty, and that's why we're losing some of our best songwriters. It's because they can't afford to stay in the business anymore. Something's got. They're to Uber drivers. I mean, seriously, how yeah. sad is that? That's sad. Really, true American poets. I mean, I, I would like to if I could have just a couple of things change. It would be that. I know. I get back to those days. Good old days, man. I miss them too. I really, really do. It seems so much easier in a lot of ways. Even well, though it wasn't. It, it had its charm too, you know. Nowadays, are you cutting EPs on your artists, or are you cutting yeah. four records? So you're doing four things. Four, four. It depends. Uh, we'll do a five song EP, or we'll do a record if it seems like there's enough demand for it. But we're kind of bundling up EPs now and turning them into records. And and I like the process, you know, going back to the old album days where you actually you, you're working on, you know, ten, eleven, twelve songs, and you're you're really not only thinking about what you cut, but where you place it, the space between the songs, you know, the fade outs, you're putting all that stuff together. You're working on artist packaging. I remember waiting on albums to come out when I was a kid and I actually get into the record store so I could read all the credits and the see everything notes. that's going on. There was all the magic about all that. Absolutely. We've lost all that. And you'd sit there and you would toil over the playlist so that it, that the album flowed the way that you wanted it to. Oh, oh, so many times I would take and flip songs and move this one to the top and put this one at the bottom. I mean, just obsessing over the track listing. Absolutely. Yeah. Obsessing over everything. Yeah. yeah. And now no one listens that way anymore. No, it's just a single song thing, yeah. man. It's on Spotify or wherever you platform Or is. how great was it to plant into the same room for four or five days with a band and cut your record all at once? Oh, and yeah. And be in there and create that energy and that magic, and those guys would come in. and uh, I don't and There was a magic about it that we've sort of don't have anymore you know i've always been a fan of dan huff too and i never got a chance to work with him as a producer but he did play guitar on uh, a couple of things on my i see it now album, my third album that james tried to produce and yeah some of the some of the tastiest stuff uh, guitar wise i mean he was just such a great guy How, what's he like as a producer to work with he's a horrible human being <laughs> he's just he's one of the worst people i've ever come across and yeah. uh, um dan, <laughs> dan is one of the best human beings i've ever met in my life and he I have the honor of calling him a, a true dear friend. He's been so good to me. Through that Chicago record, he really helped me a lot and gave me a lot of great advice about how to handle those situations with such, you know, storied and revered musicians. And he, he gave me a lot of wise counsel. But he is a wonderfully gifted musician. Obviously, his guitar playing speaks for itself. He's been on so many huge pop and rock records, let alone all the country records he played on. But... He is one of those true musical geniuses. I mean, he is a muso through and through, and it's been a privilege and an honor to learn from him over the years the way I've been able to. And he's um, he's producing one of our acts right now. They're in the studio today, but he has always been kind to me and believed in me and supported me. Where do you see uh, yourself as a label executive and as a musician and touring? Where do you see yourself in the next five years? I hope that, Red Street is wildly successful with the help of Jenny Smythe. And um, I also hope that we have the kind of artists that have careers that are sustainable and last. And that's my true hope for them is that they have a home and a place that they feel like they can make their music the way that they want to. And they know that they've got somebody in me who's an artist first that will give them every opportunity and every tool at my disposal to ensure that they have the most success that they can have. Do you think country music as a format is healthy right now? I do. Yeah. I do. I like the fact that we're, 
I've always liked the fact that we're so welcoming for people to come over here and make music with us if they want to. And they didn't necessarily start in country music, but they have something they want to say and they can come over and dip their toe in here. I, I love that. And I think it's broadened even more, you know, from the 80s when, you know, Alabama was a pop band. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, he, you had Kenny and Dolly and, and things on the fringe, and, and you still had George Strait and Randy Travis and Keith Whitley and all those things. I, you know, there was such diversity back then, and I think it's even broader now. You have so many influences from R&B and rap music and everything else. It's just such an influx of every genre that you can imagine. And yeah. country just kind of soaks it all in and makes it their own. I think that's still very cool to me. Uh, me too. I love that too. You know, we were obviously derided back in the day for being too pop and too slick. And, you know, it was just kind of one of those things to where everything comes full circle. I mean, Merle Haggard was kicked off the opera because he had horns. You know, they, they said he was too rowdy. So I, I just think we go through these cycles of like, you know, people that shake things up aren't necessarily a bad thing for our industry. I like that we can have enough space for everybody to create. I remember being out when Billy Ray Cyrus hit, man. Everybody was so down on Billy Ray. I toured with Billy Ray a lot. I loved him. We spent a lot of time together. I love him, too. I mean, I mean he was just a cool dude, man. He, but he was he was definitely not your traditional cowboy hat-wearing country guy. It was a whole different thing. No. Man. And he was great. He took it in stride because he didn't care. He didn't care. No. He put his high tops on, went yeah. on out there and did his thing. Yep. It was good times. Man, I, I don't know what else. Uh, let's, what, what have I missed? What else can we talk about? We've touched on your history stuff. You know, I don't, I don't think you, I mean. It, I've been sitting and talking about the music business all day long. But oh, I, me too. You know, because I, I still am very passionate about all of it. I just don't want to keep flogging the same old stuff over and over. No, again. no, I think it was. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about charity because you did come up, and I think that would be a really good way to even. Uh, we talked about a little bit of it a while ago. What else could we talk about? How does a fella get his face on some beef jerky? That's what I want to know. I'm looking for some sponsors. Yeah, we're looking for some sponsors, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those things are getting ready to hit the store this fall, and, and uh, I had reached out to them. I'd known uh, Weston and Jody Clark, who had the Brave Experience brand, uh, and uh, I actually went out and did a hunt with them in Colorado, and uh, they've come out and, and uh, had some recipients of some uh, war veterans and stuff, some military veterans that they've getting, given hunts to and things. And uh, the reason that I went to them, they've, Weston's background, his family has had uh, jerky lines and injections and stuff in, in like the Bass Pro Shops and different retailers around the country for years. And I have a daughter that has bad gluten allergies and celiac, yeah. and we really wanted to do something that was gluten-free and uh, no antibiotics and all healthy. Mm -hmm. So that was the direction that we did. And these are getting ready to hit the stores. And we also have a turkey injection line, a brine, and a marinade that we're going to do oh, for wow. turkeys this fall. So I'm ready That's to get all this stuff in the stores. And a portion of the proceeds are all going into my uh, foundation called Mission Possible. So That's so great, That's man. Stuff comes from. I'm proud of all you're doing here, too, man. This is fantastic. It's really fun, man. You, are you working on new music at all? I, I'm getting ready to start. Uh, my last project I did was my 30th anniversary, and I did a three-disc uh, compilation, and I wrote pretty much all of it. I did several remakes and wrote pretty much all the new stuff, and I just kind of hit the wall. Yeah. And uh, yeah. after that, it was kind of the closing of, of that chapter of my life, and I just kind of took a big hiatus, and then we've been working so much the last couple of years. It's just I, I've got I've to get my head back into writing yeah. and be creative again. I have to shut things off to be able to get back to the creative process. No, it's not, always good to refill, yeah. shut down and fill back up. And there's so many new things, you know, you travel and you experience and you meet new people and you absorb knowledge and I write down song ideas all the time and just kind of collect all the information. And at some point you get ready to kind of get it all back out there. Yeah, I totally understand. I can't wait to hear what you come up with next, man. I'm excited about it, man. Always a pleasure to see you, my Absolutely. friend. Thank you for giving me a little bit of your time. I you wish you all the best in the future. Red Street Records, hopefully it's going to be a great hit. I, I appreciate that. My pleasure to be here. Good to see you, buddy. Thank you, brother. Jay DeMarcus. Hey.